Good evening. If you could take your seats, we'd like to begin. My name is Melody Knowles, and I'm the Acting Dean and President at Virginia Seminary, and I'd like you to welcome both you and our speaker here tonight. The Reverend Dr. Albert T. Mollegen taught New Testament and Ethics at Virginia Theological Seminary from 1936 until 1974. Dr. Mollegen was a powerful, charismatic teacher, deeply committed to an ongoing conversation between the church and the public square, fostering dialogue between theology and structures of power. He inspired generations of students to become more engaged with social justice issues. It's against this remarkable backdrop that the Mollegen Forum was established to help carry on this heritage of ethical, theological engagement with public issues. In these forums, we are invited to listen and think with a distinguished panel on a particular issue facing society and church. Given the esteem that Virginia Theological Seminary holds Professor Mollegen in, we are particularly pleased that members of the Mollegen family are present with us this evening as our honored guests. I believe you're sitting here. Where, could you stand up, please? Daughter, son, and granddaughters, welcome. In conjunction with our Center for Anglican Communion Studies Women of the Communion Year, our keynote speaker this evening is Secretary Madeline Albright. Madeline K. Albright is chair of Albright Stone Ridge Group, a global strategy firm, and chair of Albright Capital Management, an investment advisory firm focused on emerging markets. Dr. Albright was 64th Secretary of State of the United States. In 1997, she was named the first female Secretary of State and became at that time the highest ranking woman in the history of the U.S. government. From 1993 to 1997, Dr. Albright served as the U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations and was a member of the President's Cabinet. She's a professor in the practice of diplomacy at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Dr. Albright chairs the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs. She's also the president of the Truman Scholarship Foundation and a member of the U.S. Defense Department's Defense Policy Board. In 2012, she was chosen by President Obama to receive the nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, in recognition of her contributions to international peace and democracy. And in 2014, it was our distinct honor to award Secretary Albright with our own Dean's Cross here at Virginia Seminary. This award recognizes outstanding leaders who embody the baptismal vow to strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. Just to say there's a room uh, across the way where we have a plaque honoring all of the recipients of the Dean's Cross and just personally, whenever I see the name Madeline Albright, <laughs> I must say I do stand up a little straighter. <laughs> Ten years ago, Madeline Albright wrote The Mighty and the Almighty. In this text, she explores the constructive part that religion can play in domestic and foreign policy and the necessity for politicians and policymakers to engage with religion. Ten years on, we were left wondering if Secretary Albright was writing a new edition of The Mighty and the Almighty, what would be the same? And what would be different? Ten years on, how would Secretary Albright address the relationships between religion and public policy? And these are exactly the questions we've invited Dr. Albright to address this evening. Distinguished guests, panelists, Sisters and brothers, you are welcome to Virginia Theological Seminary for and the 2016 Mollegen Forum. Addressing the topic, the life of faith and the life of the nation, I introduce to you Secretary Madeline Albright. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that 
very kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here again, and thank you all for coming. I truly am delighted to return to the Virginia Theological Seminary, and I want to thank the Center for Anglican Communion Studies for inviting me to be here. Two years ago, I was honored to receive the Dean's Cross from VTS, and I deeply admire the Center's efforts to promote vigorous cooperation among people of good faith. So I am familiar with this institution's storied history, and I must say, I left to speak at places that were born before I was. Uh, <coughs> uh, um, uh, I also cannot think of a better place to prepare to watch tomorrow's first presidential debate than a seminary. Ordinarily, when I... <laughs> Ordinarily, when I speak, people ask me a lot of hard questions, so it's great to be in front of an audience where I can get around those questions simply by encouraging everyone to pray. Uh, uh, but I'm also happy to be here this evening because religion has always been a very important part of my life, albeit in a somewhat unusual fashion. I was raised a Roman Catholic, became an Episcopalian, upon marriage and discovered shortly before I became Secretary of State that my family heritage was Jewish. As a diplomat, this gave me an enormous advantage because <laughs> where my colleagues could only engage in inter-religious dialogue with others, I could at any time retreat into a corner and start talking to myself. Uh, uh, still, my closest connection is to the Episcopal Church. And Years ago, I had the honor of serving on the governing board of the National Cathedral, and those of you who have been on a vestry might appreciate that at the start of each meeting, we would say a prayer, gaze serenely around the room, and start arguing. Uh, uh, naturally, the most passionate quarrels were over the least important issues. Church doctrine barely came up. What really mattered was deciding on the rose window or the best shade of brown to paint the gargoyles. If you attended church today, and I'm sure you all did at least once, chances are that you heard readings from Timothy and Luke about the perils of haughtiness, about how money is the root of all evil, and about how we should show compassion toward the poor, lest we end up like the rich man in the story about Lazarus, be begging for a single drop of cooling water amid the flames of hell. Like many such texts, these were designed less to comfort the afflicted than to afflict the comfortable, and I have to admit they do a pretty good job of it. But tonight, I don't want you to worry. I'm not a theologian, I don't do sermons, and I'm not even particularly well behaved, so I'm uh, not going to concern myself with your, or for that matter, my individual ethics and morality. But I continue to be fascinated by the connections between religious teachings and national policy, especially when the nation we're talking about is this one. As uh, was said, about a decade ago, I wrote a book entitled The Mighty and the Almighty, Reflections on God, the United States, and Foreign Policy and the Almighty discussed ethics and the U.S. intervention in, in Iraq, the need to understand Islam, the value of political bipartisanship, and the future of the Middle East. So there was nothing the least bit controversial about it, uh, <laughs> though the title of chapter six is The Devil and Madeleine Albright. When it was first published, I went to Europe to help publicize it and gave some interviews and posed for an awful lot of pictures. And among the people I encountered was a Dutch photographer who had brought with him a stuffed bird that he referred to as a peace pigeon. I thought perhaps he meant a dove, but when I looked closely, I had to agree it was a pigeon. The photographer asked me to hold the bird while he moved about trying different angles. After several minutes, of holding a stuffed pigeon, I began to feel pretty silly and had trouble keeping a straight face. <laughs> this made the photographer very mad, and he said, Madam Secretary, you cannot smile. You must be serious. This is a serious pigeon. <laughs> uh, uh, ever since, when I've been tempted to smile at the wrong time, the words pop into my head, the pigeon is serious, at which point I promptly lose it. Uh, 
stuffed birds aside, I have to admit that a lot has changed in the world since I wrote my book, but then again, a lot has not. The administration of George W. Bush was much more explicit than President Obama has been about the role of faith in shaping public decisions and policy. In his second inaugural address, President Bush said, and I quote, America in this young century proclaims liberty throughout the world and to all the inhabitants thereof, unquote. He did not add that in Leviticus, God assigned that same task in the same words to Moses. We haven't heard that kind of rhetoric very often, uh, in part because the euphoria that surrounded the so-called mission accomplished in Iraq has long since turned sour, and because the conservative wing of the Christian evangelical movement has found itself this year in a rather peculiar position, the details of which I would love to dwell on but will instead bite my tongue. But what has not changed are two basic questions that we all ought to be asking ourselves that were at the center of my book 10 years ago. In the realm of foreign policy, does religion even matter, and if so, in what way? And if re religion is relevant, how do we manage its influence so that the results are positive and not destructive? These are questions that I would like to briefly review with you this evening. Like those of you with gray hair, mine actually is underneath, or no hair, I was part of a generation that was taught to keep God and religion as separate as possible from foreign policy. I grew up with the Cold War when our enemy was godless ideology communism. In the 1950s and 1960s, the thing that excited Americans the most was technology. We were obsessed with the space race, the arms race, the advent of automatic dishwashers, and the miracle of watching Walt Disney in color. To a large extent, the same fascination with modernity was also evident overseas. The Arab nationalist movement, for example, was led by secular figures such as Nasser, who associated religion with backwardness. A lot of people welcomed this trend. They saw it as rational and enlightened. After all, they would say, hasn't religion almost always been a cause of division, bloodshed, and hate? When I was in the government, I heard that mantra all the time. And this was because foreign policy professionals were trained to view religion skeptically and to avoid it whenever possible. Their argument was that people make better decisions when rational and that nothing makes humans less rational than religion. In fact, they invented a saying, good people do good things, bad people do bad things, but for good people to do bad things, that takes religion. <laughs> for proof, they pointed to the remembrance of disasters past, from the Crusade to the Thirty Years' War, and to what has been referred to in Northern Ireland as the Troubles. Even in the 1990, when I was in office, religion was contributing to some harrowing events. In the Balkans, Serb soldiers were committing ethnic cleansing in the name of protecting Christian Europe from the Muslim Turks. In Asia, India began testing nuclear weapons, and Pakistan felt the need to follow suit. What could go wrong? In Egypt, I met with a president whose predecessor, Anwar Sadat, had been killed by religious fanatics. And in Israel, I exchanged hugs with Leah Rabin, whose husband had been murdered by a man who was certain he was doing God's will because his rabbi had told him so. But it was not until 9-11 that the foreign policy establishment in our country truly reawakened to what had, in fact, been the case all along. Religion still mattered, and in a way that cannot simply be compartmentalized. Yes, it has a personal dimension that is felt in the heart and mind of every person of faith, but it also has a direct and ongoing impact on world affairs, and we ignore that truth at our peril. We cannot escape the fact that religious convictions are a vital part of what causes many people to do what they do. And so, in answer to the first question I posed a couple of minutes ago, yes, religion is relevant to foreign policy. The second question is how to manage religion's influence so that the results are positive and not destructive. And that is where the rubber meets the road, and it begins with a basic recognition. We can't influence or guide what we don't understand. 
It is true, of course, that the United States observe a constitutional separation between church and state, but there is nothing in the Constitution that requires our diplomats to be ignorant. People in American embassies across the globe should be able to communicate with as many people as possible and in their own terms. And that means they should not be afraid to enter into discussions about religious motivations and beliefs. This was a major theme of my book, and I'm pleased to say that at least some people out there were listening. In the last decade, the Foreign Service Institute has begun to emphasize training in religious concepts and themes in a big way. We have a fantastic ambassador for international religious freedom, David Saperstein, who is getting other countries interested in working cooperatively precisely in this arena. And two years ago, Secretary of State John Kerry established an Office of Religion and Global Affairs that is working with the entire diplomatic corps based on the idea that understanding a country's religious dynamics is just as important as knowing its language, culture, and history. Meanwhile, religious leaders and followers from a variety of faiths have been playing a hugely positive role on key issues. Examples include the campaign to curb greenhouse gas emissions, the approval of a global agenda for sustainable development between now and 2030, the normalization of diplomatic relations between the United States and Cuba, and the effort to respond in a humane way to the incredible human suffering caused by the war in Syria and the outflow of refugees from the Middle East and North Africa. Amid all the troubles and turbulence of our era, the call of conscience is still being heard, leading again to the question of whether we can truly realize religion's potential to bring people together. What encourages me is that for all the differences of doctrine, the underlying values of most religions are similar. The golden rule has roots in almost every culture. What worries me is that our politics and our media are full of figures who want to exaggerate differences and exploit fears. And in the decades since I wrote my book, those voices have gotten much louder. What's ironic, of course, is that these loud voices are fueling the same narrative promoted by terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS, otherwise known as Daesh. Because let's be clear, nothing is more helpful to terrorist leaders than when public figures in the United States and Europe claim that the West is under attack by Islam. And that is the impression we create when we suggest that our country should shut our borders to Muslims, when we make up lies about the actions and loyalties of Muslim Americans, when we overreact to a few horrible incidents, or when we allow blatant examples of anti-Muslim bigotry to go unanswered. We need to remember that the first rule in public life is to frame the choice. We will prevail in this confrontation if people believe that the great divide in the world is between those who think it's okay to murder innocent people and those who think it's wrong, between the terrorists and those who are not terrorists. We will be in for a very long struggle if people believe the choice is between those supporting Islam and those attacking Islam. And that is precisely the fight that Daesh wants to have. But the truth is that when Muslims commit terrorist acts, they are not practicing their faith. They are betraying it. Not long after September 11th, I was on a panel with Elie Wiesel. He asked us to name the unhappiest character in the Bible. Some said Job because of the trials he endured. Some said Moses because he was denied entry into the promised land. Some said the Virgin Mary because she witnessed the crucifixion of her son. Elie Wiesel said he believed the right answer was God because of the pain he must surely feel in seeing us fight, kill, and abuse each other in the Lord's name. And that's why I believe we have no greater task than to build bridges of understanding between people of different cultures and religions. And by that, I don't mean mere tolerance. I don't like the word tolerance. 
that's tolerate, put up with. I mean genuine understanding and respect. Is it possible? You tell me, but consider that last December, Al-Shabaab gunmen stopped a bus near the town of Alwa, Kenya, demanding that the passengers separate themselves according to faith. Instead, the Muslims shared headscarves with the Christians to conceal their identity, said one Muslim passenger, and I quote, we stuck together tightly. The militants told us they would shoot us, but we still refused and protected our brothers and sisters. Finally, the terrorists gave up and left. About 15 months ago, a group affiliated with Daesh attacked one of the oldest Shiite mosques in Kuwait. 27 worshipers lost their lives. The attack's purpose was to sow hatred between Sunni and Shia Muslims. Instead, Kuwait Sunni leaders urged their followers to pray at the Shiite mosques. 35,000 people attended a funeral for victims. The government vowed to rebuild the mosque and a Sunni business leader offered to do the job for free. So can religion be a positive force in the affairs of the world? Again, you tell me. Years ago, when I was Secretary of State, I met a boy in Uganda. He was about six years old, and I asked the usual question, how are you? And he said he was doing quite well, considering the fact that his mother had been killed in a massacre a few weeks earlier, and he had crawled out from beneath her body and walked miles to a refugee camp, carrying his little sister on his back. The boy was being cared for by a group of volunteers who for years have been trying to protect people from something called the Lord's Resistance Army, which kidnapped children and butchered families, all in the name of the Ten Commandments. It was the kind of place that we might call God-forsaken, except that it had not been forsaken by the people who ran that refugee camp. Those people were truly guilty of religion. They held open the door to faith, but they were not the type of demand baptism as a condition for help. They just fed those who needed nourishment and provided a place where endangered families could be safe. Not long after, I went to a second refugee camp, and this one was in Sierra Leone. What made the camp special is that because of the vicious nature of that country's civil war, most of the refugees were children, and all of them were amputees. I remember holding a little girl named Mamuna, who wore a red jump jumper, and who, while we talked, used her one arm to play with a toy car. Mamuna was three years old, about the age of one of my grandchildren. I couldn't help but wonder how anyone could have shot that girl. After all, whom did she threaten? Whose enemy was she? Mamuna was not alone in that camp. There were many others waiting for prosthetics to replace the limbs they had lost. But if there was any self-pity in that camp, I certainly didn't hear it. If there was anger or bitterness, I didn't feel it. What I witnessed instead were teams of dedicated doctors and nurses inspired by their religious beliefs, doing all they could to heal the wounds that other human beings had opened. In recent decades, we have all seen the damage that the perversion of religion can cause. But this should reinforce, not undermine, our determination to show the good that spiritual faith can do. One view of religion is to see it as a collection of exclusive clubs, with each having its own rituals and rules, but with only a single club our own having full possession of the truth. In that case, the message to all is that you either belong to the club or you don't. You're either fully blessed or forever cursed, truly in or completely out. A second view is that the house of, has of many mansions, where the rooms may be different, but there is room for all who seek shelter. In my career, I have been called a witch, a snake, a liar, and my favorite, elderly but dangerous. Uh, 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 so I'm not afraid to be called a heretic, and I will confess to you tonight that, uh, tonight that I believe in the house of many mansions. Such a structure is consistent, in my view, with the best ethical and moral traditions of every major religious faith. It is in keeping with our fundamental need to live and work together as fellow inhabitants of this deeply troubled 
and ever-shrinking globe. It honors the principle of respect for every human being, and it encourages to follow in the footsteps of Paul's admonition to Timothy to be rich in good works and to fight the good fight. Before closing, I should mention that a few years ago, after I told my story about the three-year-old in Sierra Leone, a member of the audience came up to me and suggested a meeting, or perhaps I should say a reunion. That's when I learned that that little girl I had once held in my arms, the child Mamuna, had since been adopted by Americans and had turned into a healthy and happy teenager living on the same street I do in Washington, D.C., and playing basketball with her one arm. It goes to show that although not all prayers come true, the ones that do are worth it. Thank you all so very much, and I now look forward to our discussion. My name is uh, Robert Heaney. I'm the Associate Professor of Christian Mission and the Director for the Center for Anglican Communion Studies here at Virginia Theological Seminary. Following on from the Dean's introduction of Secretary Albright, it's my pleasure to introduce to you two women who in important but different ways are involved in this intersection between religion and public affairs. With degrees from Pennsylvania State University and Millersfield University, Patricia Kasari is a legislative, legislative, I can almost say that, the legislative representative for international policy for the Episcopal Church and the Evangelical Lutheran Church based here in DC. Her interests and work focus on advocacy and policy development in relation to food security, gender-based violence, human rights, and peace building. Sarah Snyder holds several degrees from the University of Cambridge, including a PhD in Biblical and Quranic interpretation. This month sees her take up a new role as the Archbishop of Canterbury's Director for Reconciliation. Her interests and work as a faith-based mediator includes a focus on conflict transformation, developing good disagreement, and advocating for persecuted religious minorities. Ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, please do welcome our distinguished panelists, Secretary Madeleine Albright, Ms. Patricia Kasari, and Sarah Snyder. So the format for this evening is pretty simple. I have a series of questions uh, that emerge in light of Secretary Albright's work and writing and address this evening that we're going to talk about together. Members of the audience, when they got their tickets, were invited to submit questions ahead of time uh, via email, and we have received some of those. If you are a person who submitted a question, when I mention your name, can you please raise your hand so that one of our ushers can find you and bring you a microphone? Most of the audience questions relate to specific issues that are of concern right now to the life of the nation, the nations, and the life of faith. I would only ask you that you stick to the question that you submitted ahead of time. <laughs> now, given that Secretary Albright, um, given what she just said, I confess to being a bit worried. Now that we have prayed together, we're going to turn to fight together. But let's see how it goes. So let's begin with a, a basic um, question. Published in 2006, 
Secretary Albright's important book, The Mighty and the Almighty, argues for the importance of religion in public policy and international affairs. Secretary Albright, you say, and I'm quoting, American diplomats need to think more expansively about the role of religion in foreign policy and their own need for expertise. They should reorientate US foreign policy institutions to take fully into account the immense power of religion to influence how people think, feel, and act. So let's begin then with a very basic question, and I'd like to begin with Sarah. What in terms of your own thinking, feeling, and acting does it mean to be a religious person anyway? Simple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that to be religious means to have a relationship with God. Uh, as a Christian, I understand that relationship through the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and secondly from that, I would say that to be religious means to know that I am reconciled with God. And that again is through the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and thirdly, I would say that it means to be a praying person, yeah. someone who communicates with God. Yeah. Patricia, same question. Um, for me, in addition to many points that Sarah makes here, um, I think being a religious person also, as a Christian, is reflected in James chapter 2, verse 14, uh, matching our faith and deeds. And I think faith can be transformative, and when we actually act with our faith, we're able to uh, meet new people, meet uh, other religious uh, people from different traditions who, through that work, you come to a very good understanding of why you exist together as human beings. Mm. And Secretary Albright, hearing this, the, the way you framed religion, thinking, feeling, acting, in your experience, and how do you um, define a religious person in light of that framing? I think those were wonderful statements from my colleagues, and I think express the importance of religion in people's lives and in their relationship with others. And since a lot of diplomacy is about relationship with others, um, I think that it helps if you are a religious person who actually respects the religion of others and knows enough about it to respect it, which means that you do have to study the basis of the religion. I do think the more I, one of the, I, I teach, and I talk, teach about diplomacy, and what it's about is being able to put yourself into the other person's shoes so that you can figure out what it is they need. Um, and I think that that's something that's very basic, as you have described religion, um, and it's certainly something that God and Jesus Christ have taught us, is to put ourselves into other people's shoes. Mm. And Sarah, given some of your academic work, uh, where do you see the tensions, given your definition of religion and a religious person, um, where do you see the tensions and the difficulty with conversations around conflict and how identities might clash? Here, yeah, now I'm on. Um, I love uh, what Secretary Albright said about stepping into another's shoes. And I, uh, I profoundly believe that the um, heart of conflict transformation uh, is the ability to step into somebody else's shoes and then to look at yourself through their eyes so that you see how they see you. Um, and then you get back into your own shoes at the end of that experience, and, and you're changed through that uh, process. So, so it's not about uh, pretending that we're all the same. Mm. It's not about me becoming you or you becoming me. Mm. Um, it's about uh, listening more than it is about talking, and it's about developing that level of empathy that says, I now understand, I've heard you. I now see how you see me. This is how I respond. Yeah. Does that... Makes sense, yeah. Uh, as you mentioned in your speech, Secretary Albright, much of the physical and political landscape of the mighty and the almighty is as familiar to readers in 2016 as it was to readers in 2006. 
Afghanistan, Haiti, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey. These are all places that are still in the headlines. And you wrote, if diplomacy is the art of persuading others to act as we would wish, effective foreign policy requires that we comprehend why others act as they do. And maybe I'll begin with Patricia. I'd like you, uh, each of you to reflect a little bit further um, on your own understanding, uh, specifically around how religion and religious conflict is understood, how violent discourse is understood, and what is often reported as religious violence. How, how do you understand that? I think what we often hear is just the surface of what is really happening. Um, a lot of times, I've, I've seen uh, people who work in places like Somalia, for example, in peace building, Nigeria, in the Boko Haram area, uh, where there's a lot of extremism that's happening. Uh, but when you're actually on the ground, uh, you have you know, sultans and pastors and people from other faith traditions who are actually doing work to counter those narratives and it's actually working. Now, it's usually on a smaller scale um, and it doesn't get reported, um, but it's happening. So I see uh, that this goes as a failure for us to actually communicate the, some of the good things that are happening in yeah. our communities around the world and here in the United States. Um, even uh, there's an organization that the Episcopal Church and the ESCA are members of. Uh, it's called, uh, it's a campaign actually, Shoulder to Shoulder. Um, and, and the work is uh, around countering anti-Muslim uh, sentiments in this country. And it was started by, you know, interfaith ecumenical partners here mm -hmm. and it's, it's doing such a great job, but unfortunately it doesn't make it to, to CNN and, and the mm. like, um, mm. so. Mm. And just to do a little bit of per advertising for Virginia Theological Seminary, if you go on our website and, I was gonna say Google, search Dodoma Statement, you'll see a little bit of the work we tried to be involved in in East Africa. Sarah, the same question for you, religious violence, violent religious discourse, how are you understanding that? So I'm just going to try and be a little different and yep. say, seeing as we were given this permission by uh, uh, Secretary Albright, uh, to say that being radical isn't necessarily bad. Mm -hmm. Jesus was radical. I have four teenagers. They like to think they might be radical. <laughs> um, Martin Luther King was radical. Mm. Um, radicals, uh, you know, we, the media loves to um, couple these words, you know, radical extremist violence and religion, and, and actually they're not um, necessarily evil in themselves. It's the way in which they're used and hijacked. And the other thing I was going to say is that um, we often think of the Quran and, and uh, Islam as uh, being an, a, a religion of violence, and the media like us to, to think that um, the so-called terrorists are, are using the Quran to uh, justify their violence, but we only have to read our own Old Testament or Hebrew Bible and it is full of the same violence. So of course the point is how we read and understand our scriptures in the context in which we live. It's not the scriptures themselves and neither is it the religion. Uh, so I, I prefer to think of um, political extremists or economic extremism. There's lots of other reasons why people uh, will twist and turn a religious uh, sacred text into something that is, is evil and wrong. Can you say a little bit more and give us a few tips on how to treat these texts, our own texts, when there is so much violence in the text, when the center of our faith has an emblem of violence? How do, how do you approach those texts? We, um, in Cambridge, uh, and in fact now all over the world, we have an amazing practice called scriptural reasoning, where uh, Muslim uh, imams, clergy, and rabbis initially, and now it's spread out way beyond that, uh, will uh, come together in order to look at our most difficult texts. And one of the things that's most helpful about that practice is that outsiders are reading our texts and asking us questions. And so we're reading our own texts, and we think, oh, we know this text, we've 
heard it lots of times, we've learned in seminary how to teach it. And somebody else says, but what about this? You know, and, then, and then you're forced to think much more deeply. And again, it's this idea of, of through somebody else's eyes, you're looking back at yourself and thinking, gosh, so that's what they think. That's how they, um, they, they think we're reading this text. And, and, and actually, I found that a very helpful way of reading our own text with humility, our own scripture with humility, um, and saying, we haven't got all the answers. We're, 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 we're searching. And, and, and maybe what we're doing is we're having to listen. We're listening, first of all, to God. And then we're also listening to those outside our community who come to us with these deep questions that mm. help us search for, for better answers, more uh, healing answers. Mm. Secretary Albright, the same kind of question. You've talked a little bit about that this evening, so-called religious violence, violent religious discourse. Um, do you veer one direction or the other, or does it depend on the context? That's to say, this religion is, a, is, is part of the problem. Uh, this is a um, departure from the religious conviction. Tonight we heard you say it's a departure. Is it ever not? Um, a departure, but the religion itself is a bit of the problem. Well, I, I'm fascinated by what you were saying in terms of reading the scriptures. I have to say that I am reading parts of the Old Testament every day. Mm. Um, it's pretty violent. Um, mm. And I think the thing, and I just kind of wondered in terms of, and the reason I think that it's worth looking at when it was written mm. and the historical context is certainly true for the Old Testament. And it's true for the Quran. I think we have to understand, which is one of the things um, that I think we have a tendency not to see the holy books as being part of a historical era or culture. Uh, I know some of the things um, in the Muslim world have nothing to do with religion, but with the culture um, of the country that they've come from. And I think that is the, the reason why people really need to study what is going on. I find the hardest part and I'm doing some work now, if I just might explain, I try desperately to be bipartisan. Uh, and I am doing a study of the Middle East with Steve Hadley, who was um, President Bush's national security advisor. And we're taking a much deeper look at the Middle East and have papers on a number of different parts. And some of them is about religion and how, what has happened in that religion and the evolution of it. Um, has in fact affected what is going on now. And the hardest part, and it goes a little bit to what you both said, are even the words or what the adjectives are um, and how you describe something. I have a good friend here, Bill Woodward, who we were talking about this at the time that we we're, that were writing the book. And there's this term, moderate Muslims. Bill told me to say, moderate, mu it's a bad termino terminology because moderate Muslims believe passionately in moderation. So, you know, none of the words work. And if somebody's a fundamentalist or an extremist, or even is the term Islamic correct? Um, and I don't think that it is at the base of the religion. I think the religion has been hijacked by people who are trying to use it for their own political purposes. And we have to remember that. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple of uh, questions from the audience coming up. Uh, Cynthia Drago. Um, Cynthia, um, she's right there. Cynthia um, provides us with a question that kind of will act as a follow-up to what we've been talking about. And she particularly wants us to consider not only how we understand uh, violent discourse and action, but how it might be countered religiously. Cynthia. My question um, is, what is the most effective interfaith activism strategy that will systematically advocate for these three things? The principles of nonviolence, the acceptance of the cultural and human value of women around the world, and the responsibility for preventing radicalization of hate into action. Thank you. Okay, so we're thinking about practical um, principles here. Nonviolence, dignity and value of women, and preventing radicalization. Patricia. That's a fantastic question. Uh, thank you, uh, Cynthia. I mean, I'm often um, 
reminded of when I'm, I'm working on gender-based violence or issues around women's rights. Um, I like to go back and, and look at the historic participants in those movements. And one thing I think we are discovering uh, right now is for many, many, many years, or you can say decades, a lot of those people who are doing the work were women, and rightly so, because they are the ones experiencing that. Um, but we're also discovering that there's a need to find allies, male allies, for example. Um, and you can use that thread for uh, when you are handling issues around uh, radicalization or human rights, uh, finding allies within the communities where these things are happening and coming up with the strategy together to work in those spaces. Um, so the, the narrative and who is welcome at the table has to be looked at and uh, redirected a little bit. Mm. Well, Secretary Albright, I might turn to you around these three issues. Uh, how have you seen interreligious cooperation address these effectively, or what are principles you would particularly point to to make that happen? I do think, actually, all three of the elements are necessary and important in, in different ways. I think one of the things, if I could just add an additional point to this, sometimes the disputes are ethnic in countries, uh, sometimes associated with religion, sometimes associated with whatever grouping people are from, and that adds an additional issue to it. And we have often found that women from different groups are able to find certain amount of understanding with each other. Um, but however, I do agree that we need male allies. And I'm often asked what the world would be like if it were run completely by women. And I have said, if you believe that's really good, you've forgotten high school. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I am definitely for, uh, but I, I do think that it's important to kind of look at the very, and what you were saying is that there are things going on at a different level than Boko Haram, that there are ways that there are, there can be agreement on solving a particular issue through a religious community of men and women at another level. I think nonviolence is obviously a fantastic tool, but very, very hard and very hard if you are being attacked. And I think one of the parts that I keep thinking is we need to keep putting ourselves into the position of the people that you all are dealing with in terms of peacekeeping and food security and a number of different issues that make this very, very hard. Mm. Mm. Sarah. Um, thanks for that question. I, I'd just love to share with you two programs that I've had the privilege of engaging uh, in. Um, one is to uh, um, recognize women as peace builders, not as the victims of violence. They are the victims of violence, but they're also usually the front line in peace building. They're the first people to notice changes in young people, uh, in their um, older people in their communities, and they're usually the first people to try and persuade uh, somebody in their own family out of that extremism. There are, of course, in Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab, women who are also going, uh, becoming extremists themselves, and it's a very interesting second program that I'm involved in, in, in looking at what are the drivers that lead young women, particularly, to become extreme to the point of violence. Um, and that is quite a new shift in the recruitment strategy of extremists, and uh, we're really looking into how we can uh, help reduce the likelihood of young women uh, being recruited. But the, so that's all around uh, women as peace builders. Um, the second program is about residential space and the meal table, so it's very practical. And this is a program that brings people in, men and women, from conflict zones to a different space that we like to call a brave space. It's a place where they're going to encounter those they never meet in their own community because they're afraid of them. And we get them together, and the first thing we do is we give them a meal. And um, some of the people, many of the people actually, come from cultures where you would not sit and eat a meal man and woman next to each other, let alone would you sit and eat a meal with your enemy. 
Um, and there is something profound about sharing a meal with the people that you, uh, uh, you fear. And it's a very healing process. Um, and I suppose various things come out of that. One is to say that uh, we need to take baby steps. We assume that just sitting down, men and women, is normal. It's not normal for half the world. So, so our starting point needs to be a little different uh, than we might imagine it needs to be. But secondly, to never underestimate the value of uh, providing food and hospitality and allowing people the space just to eat and to be together, that in itself is a very uh, uh, substantial um, contribution to peace building. Thank you. So religious people, many, have this desire to do good, to make positive contribution to society. It sounds like what we're saying, some of these grassroots initiatives are not given the recognition that they might. Um, Christine Johnson uh, has a question that echoes this desire for faithful orientation or reorientation as it relates to a very particular issue. And we want to hear from uh, Christine. Thank you. American Christians are, in a sense, dual citizens of the mightiest nation on earth and God's eternal kingdom. And yet, if you look at the news and listen to the political discourse, we are some of the most terrified people on the planet. I guess we're scared of losing our privileged position. So often, we use our privilege not to help those in need, but to keep them at arm's length. To use a current example, we accept a paltry number of Syrian refugees only after an exhaustive screening process to ensure they will not try to hurt us when they get here. How can we, as individual Christians, and how can the institutional church help reorient our policies to use our strength for the benefit of all, rather than simply hoarding what we have? So displaced people, 65 million maybe, 1% only ever get to go back home. And Christine raises the issue specifically of Syria and Syrian refugees. Secretary Albright, would you like to begin? Thank you very much. Um, I'm a refugee. I came to this country when I was 11 years old because my parents didn't want to live under communism. Uh, and when people ask me how to describe myself, I just say grateful American. I have the last weeks and months been spending a lot of time on the refugee issue specifically. Um, and I was in New York last week where President Obama had a summit on refugees um, and Pre Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, had a summit where all the countries were invited, but President Obama wanted those countries that actually were going to contribute. Um, and through that, he was able to motivate non-governmental organizations and the private sector to contribute to it. There was a session at the White House the week before, and it addressed specifically um, this idea of people coming to America and what do they add. So there was a, a man there who had escaped. He was a Bosnian Muslim. He had escaped Bosnia a couple of times, came to the United States, and enlisted in the Marines for 20 years. Um, there was a woman there from Syria who had, in fact, gone to Boise, Idaho, is where she went, and she described what it was like to become part of the community. You were talking about meals and people being very kind to her, and she was trying to learn how to drive and any number of things, and people would look at her and say, you're a Muslim, we can get along. I mean, it is that uh, very aspect of people-to-people -people relations. We are a very big country. We have plenty of room. Um, and I do think that the idea that uh, we gain by keeping people out, I do think the United States is an exceptional country, but we can't ask that exceptions be made for us. And I know that we cannot tell other countries what to do if we don't do our share. And without being self-serving, I do think that refugees are actually have done a pretty good job in this country. Patricia, on this issue of uh, refugees, particularly Syrian refugees. Sure, uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think for me, and this is where my frustration 
always happens in my work. Um, in a lot of our pews and congregations, we have a lot of people who care about this issue, but we often don't hear the voices. Uh, they are not engaged in the political scene. And so as a result, all you hear about is the people who are against the issue uh, of inviting refugees into our country and, and, and be a welcoming uh, communities. Um, so that's just my plug to encourage you to be involved in those uh, spaces where there are opportunities to actually make your voice be heard. Um, I loved the, uh, uh, during general convention, uh, a lot of us had this kind of souvenir to take home, and it was Jesus on the bench as a homeless man, and I loved that and, and I look at it every day in my office. Um, it's just a reminder of, you know, even Jesus was a stranger to, to his community. And, and if we are really claiming that we're Christians and we're followers of Jesus uh, and we're against this, um, against welcoming refugees, it means we're against welcoming Jesus into our community, in our lives as well. So. I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of learning that we can find in our scripture, scripture uh, that we need to actually just act on it. Thank you. So, what does that acting on it look like? So, you talk about there's an attitude, there may even be a need for people to change their attitude. But someone who's sitting in their parish every Sunday, what is it they can do uh, in your experience? Uh, from my experience, I think. So many of us here have representatives in Congress, for example. Um, so one of the actions that you can take is letting them know that you support our country welcoming refugees. Texas uh, state just announced recently that they are no longer going to be welcoming or resettling refugees in Texas. Um, and a lot of our communities have said, okay, fine, we'll take up that work. But that shouldn't happen uh, if there's a number of people in Texas who are supportive of, of us welcoming refugees. Uh, because I think the more they hear uh, that we are actually supportive of you know, the policies that are in place right now, um, the more likely you will be successful. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really political engagement, and I'm maybe biased uh, because of my work of doing advocacy and having to, to deal with members of Congress every day. But really what they say is we don't hear enough from my district. I don't hear enough from my state. Um, so we have to be able to say, look, you know, there's a number of, a lot of historians who care about this issue and call them up or, you know, email your members of Congress and say, look, I care about this issue. Um, that's the political space I think there's a gap uh, from what we believe in and what we actually do. I'm going to move to um, a, a question that's related. And Secretary Albright, you talked about us being a big country, plenty of room. I want to turn to a question that was submitted by Cornelia Eaton um, that addresses this question um, and how government um, policy and priorities uh, might not always match up to the hopes of people that live within this nation. Cornelia. Five centuries, Native American Indians, First Nations people of this land have suffered and endured political and social injustices. These issues continue today in Native American territories. How do you see building justice and peace for the rights of the Native American peoples of North America? Secretary Albright. Um, I do think that um, it is essential for us to um, recognize the rights of Native Americans and um, to, there's no way to rectify some of the things that happen, but I do think that there has to be respect and understanding. And I've been fascinated by some of the um, demonstrations that have taken place over the pipeline and uh, that that has raised the issue for people. I know what, um, I think it's this week, that President Obama is going to meet with 
um, Native Americans and the various tribes. Um, that is very important. I know when I was um, secretary, we, we did that. Um, I also think it isn't just in the United States. I think indigenous peoples everywhere um, need to be recognized and to have their rights uh, recognized and have access to justice um, and to have the possibility of voicing their needs and the rest of us understanding that they were there before. I've been very close friends with the Foreign Minister, the former Foreign Minister of Canada, who has spent a great deal of time on this, or um, a friend of mine, Hernando de Soto in Peru, that has talked a lot about property rights for indigenous peoples. And uh, while we have certainly ours here, I do think that it is something generally that has to be recognized throughout the world. Right. And Sarah, both the, the specific and then in terms of how Secretary Albright has broadened that out around indigenous peoples' rights, what kind of reflections have you on that issue? Um, it makes me think about the sacredness of land as well and uh, how we often forget living in our um, multi-tower blocks that actually for indigenous people and for all of us uh, in history, the land is, is sacred. The land is what God has given us. The land is how we make a living. Um, and I think when uh, people decide that they're going to bulldoze a path for any reason, be it a road, a, a railway line, a, a, an oil pipeline, across somebody's land, there needs to be um, care taken to engage with the people whose land that is sacred to. Um, and perhaps, I don't, don't know so well the particular example that's being mentioned here, but I know more about the Niger Delta and other places where the same issue has arisen. Um, perhaps where we've gone drastically wrong is that those who build those lines uh, have no understanding of the sacredness of land um, and its meaning to the people. So what needs to be restored is a conversation, uh, and more than that, followed by action, but initially a conversation that is about listening more than it is about talking. And it says, we want to hear why this land is so sacred to you, and we want to know how we can, how we can build this oil pipeline if it has to be built, how we can build it in a way that is going to respect the sacredness of this land and your culture and your tradition. Patricia. I agree with all the points that were <laughs> made here. Um, I think one uh, thing that has been really disheartening is, especially with the, the Dakota's pipeline, the fact that you know the, the line was supposed to go through a different community, which happened to be majority white community, and there were people who complained, and so they decided to shift it to a Native American community, and expecting not to get backlash. I think it is it's telling of of how a historical practice of not consulting, you know, minority groups when uh, when we're we're trying to do some kind of development project. Um, and so I, th I think this situation, uh, again, is, is opening to uh, the ears, historical ills that we've never been able to fix. Uh, and my hope is um, that will change soon. Yeah. Secretary Albright, beyond um, dialogue, listening, do you see anything that needs to be done at the policy level for these uh, issues, and particularly this Dakota pipeline or other similar situations that have arisen? Well, I do think that, as you pointed out, the communities are not consulted. And we are, after all, a democracy. And having a way of finding out what people in the area want to do, we do have a tendency not, in fact, to listen to minorities. Um, and this goes back again to what you had said in terms of members of Congress. They have to be made aware of it, um, and, and people need to have a voice early. Part of the problem in an, any number of situations, uh, people get a voice late, and it then makes it much more complicated, whereas if the modus operandi is to always listen to the people that are affected by something, you can manage to solve things often before they get really bad, I think. But a policy thing, I think that it does have to be that we respect people uh, 
whoever they are and i keep talking about the word respect i think and understand what people's needs are which is why as i said earlier tolerate is not the right answer tolerance tolerate just put up with we don't we need to respect so in the run up to this evening's event several people raised questions about the current political climate in the US Anyone surprised about that? And the current election season, uh, one might sum up those concerns uh, in this question. What does the current presidential election season say about the United States and how does it impact how others see us and relate to us? Let's start with Sarah. <laughs> well, I'm not American, so I don't have to answer. <laughs> Actually, I thought when Christine asked her question, I was rather wishing you, you were up for the presidential election, because yeah. it was a, a good question. Um, I, I mean, I've been working at the UN the last 18 months, so I have actually been coming and going from New York. And in our little flat, there's a, a little television the, the, in this rented flat that only has two news channels. It's Fox and CNN. And I decided that <laughs> CNN is the better of the two for, for me to watch. And, and I was saying earlier how I, I couldn't wait to get home from work to put CNN on. because and, and this was going back to the beginning of this debate. Because literally my jaw was on the floor. I, I, I had no ability to understand how this was for real. Um, and and <laughs> And I, I kind of thought of it like a soap opera. And then, then of course, the nearer we've got and the narrower the um, election has got, the, the more real and the, and the more frightening it becomes. And what I see, you know, and I'm sure all of you see this, but I see it, this election being played around fear. And it seems to me to be constantly um, digging into people's fears of the other, actually. And because that's my business <laughs> is how to welcome the other, how to understand the other. Um, I just uh, wish that there could be something or someone who is able to engage this um, dialogue, this public dialogue, with that kind of rhetoric. How do we begin to understand the other? Um, and that the other, in this case, is actually the rest of the world who looks at America, and I, I spend a lot of time in the Middle East, uh, and, and who sees a fulfillment of what they're always saying America is like in this public debate. And, and that worries me, because they see America as um, closing its borders, turning in on itself, and having a very internal, if you, if you like, a, a self-centered conversation about itself, and not showing any uh, public care or concern for the other. And of course, that's not what America is. America is completely different to that. But that's the kind of rhetoric that's getting played in the media outside America, the only bits that we tend to hear. Um, so let me jump in with a follow-up. But I don't want to be too negative, because yeah. I love America. Can I just say that? <laughs> so let, let me jump in with a follow-up that may be fairer to you, given your, where you're coming from. To what extent? was the debate around Brexit and the decision that the British people made, uh, how, to what extent does it correlate with uh, conversations and discourse here in the United States? The uh, decision around Brexit was a massive, massive shock to most people of Britain, including those who voted Brexit. Uh, they never, ever thought that that would be the outcome. Um, I, uh, we live as a family in the north of England. Most people, in fact, almost everybody around us voted Brexit. I, I was, happened to be a, a single person in our village who went down that day and didn't vote Brexit. Uh, but the reason that they were voting Brexit was actually around the immigration issue. Um, there were a few people in London who voted Brexit around the economic long-term prospects for Britain. Um, and I think that was probably, uh, you know, there's a little bit more sense in, in, in that uh, reason to vote Brexit. But the vast majority voted around the immigration issue. I see that um, quite similar here in the US um, as a major concern. And I also worry that if Brexit can happen, what could happen here? 
Patricia, presidential campaign season, the discourse, how others see us. I think it's undoing a lot of what we have tried to do uh, in terms of how uh, we have often, as the US, often related to other countries and promote democracy and promote um, certain way of, of doing elections. Um, I'm worried that we're giving them a playbook of saying, uh uh, we're not going to do what you're doing. Um, and, and it's amazing. I've been traveling, um, well, I've traveled quite a bit this year, and the first question I get asked overseas is, what's going on with your elections in the US? And I have no answer, <laughs> uh, to be honest. Um, but I'm worried that, um, you know, thinking in the African context, you have a number of elections coming up, um, and a lot of those countries would often hear from the US government, or you, you know, you're supposed to do X, Y, and Z, um, but I think that credibility uh, is a little bit um, reduced uh, in terms of uh, listening to, to the US government and, and getting suggestions to the US government from the US government in terms of how elections are done here. Um, so, but who knows, we'll, we'll see what happens. Secretary Albright, you're allowed to be a little less than objective in answering this question. I have no views. No. Uh, <laughs> let me just say that um, I am deeply troubled, but even before this election campaign, as was mentioned, I'm chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute, and uh, we don't do anything ideological. We kind of talk about the nuts and bolts of democracy. And uh, we were had some people in Egypt, and we were talking to them about forming coalitions, and um, that compromise was a good word. And they said, yeah, like you guys. So we, in fact, are no longer a good example of what should be happening. Also, um, I was in New York last week, and um, the number of people from foreign countries that would come up to ask me what was going on, um, and numbers of people from the Baltic states. I mean, given some of the things that are being said about NATO not counting, and, um, and generally that we would, might not honor Article 5, um, there were Estonians that were coming up and saying, are you, what now? Dude, can we count on you? So it has undermined us. I do believe that we are the indispensable nation, but there is nothing in the word indispensable that says alone. We need to operate with partners in order to try to figure out how to deal with the various problems that are out there. And I think that we have, um, one person in this campaign has damaged America's reputation. And I think it is very, very dangerous. I think the danger is not just in what has been said so far, but would be really dangerous if something terrible happened um, and he won. Um, the bottom line is... Uh, um, um, I have to tell you, I'm often asked if I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist who worries a lot. Um, and so I am worried that people are not recognizing the importance of this and will say they're not going to vote. And I just got, um, there was a letter from somebody that I know very well, um, uh, who was 21 um, at the time of the Kennedy um, election. And she wrote that, um, she certainly wasn't going to vote for Nixon, and she didn't think that Kennedy was perfect enough, and so she wrote in Norman Thomas, and she regrets that. And I think that people have to recognize the importance, certainly every vote counted in the 1960 election, that people need to recognize what this is all about. And you were talking about the fear factor. We can't operate on the basis of the fear factor. We got into the war in Iraq because of the fear factor. And we can't decide that, the, that we have to be afraid of people, that the United States can't play its role. I think it is, I have been involved in every election since 1972. I think that this is truly crucial and important and that um, I think that it is making us look terrible. We are not able to fulfill 
the responsibilities, and it's the job of the President of the United States to protect our territory and our people and our way of life. And our way of life depends on dealing with other countries and being a country that understands the interdependence and can be America as it was set out to be. Believe this or believe this not, my notes now say, Secretary Albright, you describe yourself as an optimist who worries a lot. <laughs> so that was nicely teed up. Uh, Adrian Himes has a question uh, that gets to the issue of experiences that might evoke hope. Good evening, Secretary Albright. As a Christian woman and former strategic policymaker for the United States, can you talk about the power of compassion and empathy when navigating difficult international situations with policymakers of different faith traditions? Is there a profound experience that you have had that would illustrate the impact of building relationship with the neighbor, often labeled as the other, which you have been alluding to? Thank you. Um, I have to say that the idea of representing the United States is the most amazing idea ever, especially if you weren't born here. And so whenever, um, I think every woman in this room will identify with this. When I first got to the United Nations, uh, the first day, uh, the meetings don't all take place in that fancy room. They, there's a back room there. And I was the only woman on the Security Council. And I thought, hmm, maybe I won't talk today. I'll see if they like me uh, and who is who. And then I saw the sign in front of me that said United States. And I knew that if I didn't speak, the voice of the United States would not be heard. And so I really thought about what experiences would really reflect what we were about. And so the meetings in the fancy rooms, you know, when you're received as the secretary and all that are interesting, but the best meetings are those um, with ordinary people in various places. I mentioned a couple in my remarks um, in terms of this little girl from Sierra Leone. But for instance, in places where I would go and um, go to hospitals or um, in Angola, I had never seen so many one-legged people because of all the landmines and children that were tethered to their homes so that they wouldn't run out into the fields um, or going to um, hospitals in South Africa where HIV and AIDS mothers were and um, or in fact spending time just listening to what various people needed uh, whether it was, the thing that drives me crazy is when we ask for money for foreign assistance, those are two words that shouldn't go together uh, because people don't want to give assistance to foreigners. The bottom line is it is a way to show how we can help people in various countries uh, that can in fact deal with basic human needs. I do think that it is that, I think that a person that represents our country needs to go and meet with people that are not in the fancy rooms, that can understand that we can't have people that have no sense about the compassion that's necessary to represent this country. Thank you. I am sorry to say that our time is up in this very fancy room. <laughs> um, so I would like to just close with uh, a note of gratitude and uh, also give you a little housekeeping notice. Uh, first, uh, thank you for joining us uh, this evening, both here in this Emmanuel Chapel and those of you that are joining us via uh, live stream online. Uh, and we're particularly delighted, of course, to Welcome to this 2016 Mollagen Four members of the Mollagen family. Second, we owe a debt of gratitude to our partners in 
this evening's event, who not only co-sponsored the event, but also led us beautifully through Evensong. We want to thank the Reverend Randy Alexander and his team and the parishioners of the Emmanuel Church in the Hill for helping us prayerfully prepare for our conversation together. And maybe because there's no gargoyles, we didn't end up fighting. I'm not sure. <laughs> or maybe it was the great Even song. And VTS, uh, Virginia Theological Seminary, along with Emmanuel, invite you to a special reception uh, before you go home in the Addison Academic uh, Building directly after uh, we close. Uh, please do keep your seats as the panel leaves the chapel, and then the ushers will direct you to where uh, the reception is. It's been an honor uh, and a delight to welcome our panelists here, Patricia and Sarah, first time to Virginia Theological Seminary. We hope it will not be your last. Uh, we really thank you for coming tonight, grateful for the work that you do, for the insights and perspectives you brought to this conversation this evening. Thank you. It's been a particular honor and delight to welcome Secretary Albright back to Virginia Theological Center. And if you hadn't noticed, Secretary Albright is wearing her Dean's Cross brooch. And also the Anglican Communion pin. So we're all covered. Um, Secretary Albright, we're deeply uh, grateful and thankful for the many years of service you've given this nation and the peoples of the world for your perspective, for your analysis, for your grace, and for your humor. And that has brightened many circumstances and many places, including this place and this time tonight. Thank you. Um, and I... Um, would very much like to thank all of you for coming and proving that communities of faith can make a difference. And so thank you, and thank you for moderating, and Patricia and Sarah, it was wonderful to be with you. But thank you so much for your kindness and your hospitality, and I'm happy to come back anytime. We'll hold thank you to that. You. Thank you. All right. Do you want to follow me?